Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Max. I'm a senior security architect at ETAS. Uh, I'm responsible for securing Escript PsychoHSM, which is the firmware um, for the leading hardware security module actually in the automotive industry. Um, before my time at ETAS, I got my PhD in hardware security at the research group of Professor Christoph Parr here at the local Ruhr University uh, and in association with the Max Planck, security for security, uh, Max Planck Institute for Security and Privacy. And I'm still an external lecturer at the university. I actually see some of my students here in the room, which is quite nice. Um, and today, um, I actually want to talk about C and C++ more from a security perspective. Because all of the talks that we hear, they are like very technology focused. They are an advances, new structures, new mechanisms that we want to use. And security is always a part of that, right? We always have to think about security when we design our systems. Uh, who of you has actually seen this, this talk? Very few. I recommend to actually watch this talk. Because with C and C++, we have one big problem. If we are not very, very careful, working with C and C++ is like 50 shades of shooting yourself in the foot with a railgun. And this can quickly escalate, right? Not just in terms of functionality, bugs, problems that we have in our features, but really in terms of security. Uh, and such security issues can, well, be quite bad, right? And there's a lot of um, progress happening. Actually, the talk here by Herb Sutter can C++ be 10 times simpler and safer. Then there's maybe the carbon language you have heard about, which also markets with safety a lot. The circle uh, compiler as well. Uh, and then there are other languages, like Rust, for example, that have this safety as one of their key arguments. And the safety in this sense is not the safety you know from cars that you just don't get injured, right? It's about the safety preventing you from introducing bugs by accident. Now, a lot of people view the situation like this. Vulnerabilities, like security issues that can actually be exploited, are just a subset of bugs. But to me, it, it looks a little different. To me, these are overlapping fields. Um, but some systems can be vulnerable even though they do not have bugs at all. So all this focus on reducing the number of bugs does help to mitigate a part of the problem, but not the entire problem. Just to give you an illustration here, this is from the university in Bielefeld, I think. Uh, and you see this system does not have a single bug. The border is raising and closing as specified, but the system is vulnerable, right? We can clearly see this. Uh, and this is just for motivation, that there, there is a gap between bugs and vulnerabilities, so there's a difference. Now, there is the Common Weakness Enumeration Register, which uh, looks at all the security issues published and um, basically classifies them in the most recurring issues. And you don't have to read this, let's just focus on the top five issues. And number one issue, still out in the wild at the moment, is out-of-bounds right. Who of us has caused an out-of-bounds right in their career? Basically everyone, right? And also the other ones, like let's cross out two and three, they are maybe not embedded focused, but three out of the top five issues occur re regularly in embedded applications. And one reason for this is just the way how we write the, uh, our code and how we interact with the code. Just to quickly motivate, let's talk about the stack. We all use the stack regularly, right? On the stack, local variables, some registers you have to save, your return address from the function you are just in, uh, and this is, this is your current stack frame, and preceding to this <coughs> at higher addresses is then the previous stack frame of the previous scope or function you are in. Now, why do we care about memory safety in all of these languages? Um, it's because working with the stack and memory in general is dangerous if we do it incorrectly, right? Let's go with this example. It's actually close to the uh, example we saw in a previous talk where someone also said, try it with 11 characters, right? Why did they say it? They wanted the application to crash. For me as a security uh, person, crashing is not a problem. If the application would crash gracefully, I would be happy. The problem is what can I provoke when I can ma uh, make the application crash? Uh, and that's much more. So let's say we are, we are entering this function. We have the previous stack frame on top, the return address of our function, saved registers, and then we have space for our buffer. If I now put something into this function, ABCD, it goes into the buffer, all fine, right? But if I put a longer string in there, I first write to my buffer, 
and then I write out of bounds, right? I overwrite the uh, saved registers, and then I overwrite the return address, and maybe some more. But that means if I do this carefully, my application will not crash, it will return to an address that I provide from the outside as an attacker. I get control over this application. We call this an arbitrary code execution in the worst case, and I think the next talk will dive deep into this topic. So this is why an out-of-bounds write is not just a crash in the application, it's actually extremely dangerous. I take control over your machine. So there was a great um, survey by Aspencore. Uh, it's a 100-page presentation. I encourage you to ha have a look at this, where they asked embedded uh, programmers several questions. Among those, my current embedded project is programmed mostly in C and C++. And with all the evidence that we saw uh, with the CWEs and the security issues in general, you would expect that when you ask the question, my next embedded pro uh, project will likely be programmed in to, to change the field. Uh, but what we see is it doesn't change at all. Somehow assembly switched with C sharp, but uh, I guess this is not security related, right? Uh, so while the embedded industry knows that there are other tools, like Rust, for example, uh, it stays with C, right? C and C++, and all the issues that come with the, uh, those languages. I just I don't want to say those languages are bad, right? They are, in fact, not really bad languages. They all have their use. They are tools. You have to know when to use them. But those C and C++ are expert languages. It's so easy to make a mistake in them. And maybe we can make it easier not to make mistakes. So why are we in this situation? Well, if you want to change, let's say we, are not, say we now all do Rust. You have to train the people. All the developers n now need to learn a new language, and that costs money. Uh, we need new tools. Compilers, uh, static analysis, and so on costs money. Uh, and it takes time. We cannot just stop writing features. Uh, it costs money. Big problem in the industry, right? Uh, but it also costs money if something goes wrong. So if life gives you lemons, ask for tequila and deal with it. This is the situation where we are. New, better languages will come, but it will take a lot of time. So we have to work with what we have. And in the C language, the core paradigm is trust the developer which to me is a bad paradigm, <laughs> right? Uh, because it puts a lot of load on our heads. We have to think about everything. Uh, and on the other side, we want to make the right thing easy to do and the wrong thing hard to do, which is difficult if the language is designed around trusting the developer not to make mistakes. So let's shift to C++, where it's trust the compiler a little more. So let's use the compiler now to reduce the burden on the developer and really help them. And I have three examples. I hope we have enough time to go through them, how we can actually use C++ to reduce the probability of introducing errors by accident. So let's say you have a system. Inputs come in. You have to process it. There will be valid inputs, invalid inputs, and malicious inputs. What do you do? You filter them, right? You want to really make sure that only the valid inputs reach your system. Uh, by the way, rank four on the CWE score. So we want to do input validation. We have two paths. We can do verification, just check and throw an error, or we do sanitization. You've heard this likely in, uh, with SQL injection. Yeah. So how can we do this in C++? Because in C, you have to remember to actually do it. But in C++, maybe we can write a simple helper, a tainted class, where we wrap a value, just a value t, and we provide it as a private member of this class. Uh, and then we have a verifier and a sanitizer that are friends, so they can access the private member, but nobody else can access the private member, right? And then we can implement them. For example, I can implement my verifier for the integer to say if the integer is larger than 10, I return the null option, uh, otherwise I actually return the value. So I've done my verification, actually, and I can return some kind of error. It's, it's just an example. You can implement it differently, right? But I now force the developer, if they want to get the integer, that is contained in the tainted value to actually use the verifier because it's private. They cannot access it otherwise, right? I prevent or I protect the developer against making a mistake. Same for the uh, sanitizer. Um, I can take the contained private value and sanitize it. For example, I limit it to a maximum here. And I prevent, again, the developer from making a mistake just by using support from the compiler. 
Um, maybe an example. Um, do not dereference null pointers is one of the uh, one of the rules that you find in secure coding guides, and it's actually also on the CWE um, letter on a rank 11 of issues, right? And what you find in C code is often something like this: yeah? long namespace prefix, uh, some function uh, name, and a lot of pointers. And what I usually see is that you have null pointer checks everywhere. And at some point, you maybe want to say, "Huh, my second function here." It actually is null intolerant. It must be have a pointer that is never null. We have no mechanism for this in C, so what do you do? Documentation. Who reads the documentation? 10% of the developers, right? So uh, what you do in addition, as uh, additional documentation, let's say you add yet another prefix or suffix to your function not null tolerant. At some point, it gets insane, right? Here's where C++ can help us. Just the language, no special mechanism, but just by introducing references, uh, references, wherever we want to say this cannot be null, because a reference cannot be null, right? We force the developer to, at least at the point where they dereference the pointer to get the reference, to think about, hey, did I do my null check? And beyond that point, they can never forget it anymore. Right? Also, static analysis tools are really good at helping you find if you forget uh, a null check before casting to, uh, getting the reference. Right? It's just using the language to write safer code, just by design principle. Um, do I have time for one final example? Okay. So the third example is now a little more complex, so follow me here. We are now talking about shared resources. So we have two cores on a system, and they have shared memory. And let's say the first core writes a string. C++ is awesome. And then the second core, as it listened to my talk and now knows how to do validation, checks whether this core contains swear words. Uh, this, this message contains swear words or is nice. And if it's nice, then it uh, schedules a printing to the screen. We can, uh, and this will happen with some delay because of the screen drivers. So we could write this in code using the example earlier like this. We first validate, and if the validation is fine, we schedule printing. What's the issue here? There, this code is vulnerable. Why is it vulnerable? Because there's an additional um, uh, dimension in here, which is time. We have a shared resource, right? And if an attacker now takes over the first core, they can say, I put C++ is awesome in here. My second core does the validation. And while it is uh, scheduling this copy to screen, I now do an additional mem copy and change it to C++ sucks. The validation has already happened on the data that was valid. But the data that is now being used when writing it to the screen has changed. We call this a time of check versus time of use vulnerability. And this is basically a weaponized race condition. And we can also mitigate this, and this is my basically final slide here, um, by encapsulating the resource that we have. In this case, just a memory, loca uh, a memory location we, write uh, we read from into a class that permits us to only read it once. We have to then buffer the data internally on our local memory, where it cannot be changed from an external source, but we prevent ourselves from reading the shared resource twice, where it can have changed in time. Right? If you want to talk more about this, just hit me up after the talk. But this is the gist of what, I'm, what, I, want to, what I want to show you. Eh? Um, because while there will be better languages, better in terms of providing us less room for error in the future, our situation is that we aren't there and that we have to cope with what we have right now. So we should focus on making the right thing easy and the wrong thing hard to do. And we can leverage C++ for this if we actually try. Right? So thanks to the amazing designers for the cool icons and thanks to you for listening. <laughs>